Ladies and gentlemen, please join me uh, for a warm welcome for our guest, Herd Builders. Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Janet. Thank you, Skirball Cultural Center, for inviting me. I'm privileged, and it's an honor for me um, to be here, to be here at the Skirball Center, to be here in California. It's a great opportunity for me to escape the wind, the cold, and the rain from my own beautiful country, the Netherlands. Ladies and gentlemen, unfortunately, free speech is no longer a given in Europe. What we once considered a natural element of our existence, a birthright, is now something we once again have to battle for. To exercise free speech in Europe has become a dangerous activity. And as you may know, I will be prosecuted in the Netherlands, in my own country, because of the short documentary Fitna you just saw, and what some call my views about what some call a religion of peace. And on top of that, also France and Jordan are considering to prosecute me. Prosecute me for my view on Islam. And the president of Indonesia unfortunately said and declared that I never will be allowed to enter Indonesia as long as I live. And the United Kingdom did not allow me to visit their country. So let me start by giving a special thanks to the United States Border Police for letting me enter this country. <laughs> it feels... It feels good to be allowed entering a country once in a while. <laughs> but, ladies and gentlemen, before I talk to you about freedom of speech, I will say a few things about Islam and about Sharia law. Allow me to give you a brief introduction on Islam, and Islam 101. And the first thing everybody needs to know is that the importance, the importance of the holy book the Quran. As you probably know, the Quran calls for submission, calls for hatred, calls for violence, for murder, for terrorism and war. The Quran calls upon Muslims to call to kill non Muslims. The Quran describes, as we have seen in Fitna, Jews as monkeys and pigs. And the biggest problem, the biggest problem is that the Quran is to be considered Allah's personal word, with orders that need to be fulfilled regardless place and regardless time. And that's the reason why the Quran is not open to any interpretation or discussion. It's valid for every Muslim and for all times. And therefore, there is no such thing, there is no such thing as a moderate Islam. Sure, there are a lot of moderate Muslims. But a moderate Islam does not exist. As the Turkish Prime Minister, Mr. Erdogan, once said, and for once I agree with him, he said, there is no moderate Islam. There is only one Islam, and that is the Islam of the Quran. Now, ladies and gentlemen, let me be clear. We have, and I have, no problems with Muslims. I have no problems with any individual. I have no problem with any group. The problem is with the Islamic ideology. And the second thing about this Islamic ideology that everybody needs to know is the importance of the so-called Prophet Muhammad. Well, because his behavior, the behavior of Muhammad, also is an example to all Muslims and cannot be criticized. Well, let me tell you the truth about the so-called Prophet Muhammad. Muhammad was a warlord. He was a conqueror, he was a pedophile, and he was a mass murderer. Islamic tradition tells us how he married and consumed the young girl Aisha before she was 10 years of age, and how he fought in battles, how he murdered his enemy, how he slaughtered the Jewish tribe of Banu Karaisa. And for millions of Muslims, the Quran and the life of Muhammad are not history are not ancient history but are an inspiration. 
And if you criticize either the Quran or the Prophet or Islam as such, you better be prepared to face the consequences. You will receive death threats from all over the world. You will be taken to court all over the world. Your national flag will be burned and your embassies might be set on fire. Your country could face economical boycotts and the political leaders of your own home country will not support you because they will appease Muslims and appease Muslim government. Join them in their politically correct outrage and label you as a xenophobe or a radical. When criticism, when criticism becomes unpleasant, freedom of speech has to take another lane. Ladies and gentlemen, let no one fool you that Islam is just a religion, because it's not. Sure, it has a God, Allah. It has a holy book, the Quran. It has temples, mosques, and even a hereafter. And if you murder enough Jews, you might even get 72 virgins. But in its essence, in its essence, Islam is a political ideology. It's a totalitarian ideology. It's a system that lays down detailed rules for society and the life of every man and woman. Islam wants to dictate every aspect of life and society, and it prohibits individual, political, and religious rights and freedoms. Islam is not compatible with Western civilization or democracy, nor will it ever be, because Islam does not want to coexist. It wants to submit and set the entire agenda. Islam, as a matter of fact, means submission. Submission from Muslims over non-Muslims, the kafirs, like you and me. So there cannot be any mistake about the real goal from Islam. The goal for Islam for all time is to dominate. To dominate and once again to dominate and establish a world ruled by Islam. And that, ladies and gentlemen, that is why Winston Churchill compared the Quran to Adolf Hitler's Mein Kampf, as the famous Italian writer Oriana Fallaci did, and why the brave Californian psychiatrist Dr. Wafa Sultan, who you probably all know, rightfully said about the clash between the West and Islam is, and she said, it's a clash between civilization and backwardness, between the civilized and primitive, between rationality and barbarity. And Wafa Sultan is fully correct. As you know, ladies and gentlemen, the current Islamization of Europe is not an invasion like we have seen in the past. This time, it's not a military invasion with swords. This time, we have to deal with a stealth invasion. Nowadays, the armies are replaced by cultural relativism, by mass immigration, by demography. And in this dangerous cocktail that is the main cause of the Islamization and is responsible for the introduction of Sharia law in Europe, our leaders are looking in the other direction. And as you know, Sharia Islamic law is effective in many barbaric countries such as Saudi Arabia and the Islamic Republic of Iran. Beheadings, hangings, chopping off hands and feet, stoning to death, lashings, it all happens because Sharia law prescribes it. And now radical Muslims want to implement Sharia law in our Western societies. For instance in Britain, a lot of people don't know that, but in Britain today Sharia courts are officially part of the legal system. Very few people are aware of that. They have in Britain, those Sharia courts, have been empowered to adjudicate on financial disputes, on divorces and on domestic violence. A few weeks ago, a British Muslim leader told his vision of Britain under Sharia law. According to the newspaper, the British Evening Standard, Mr. Anjem Shudari wants to fight for an Islamic State with Sharia law in Britain. He wants the flag of Allah over Downing Street. Ladies and gentlemen, this would mean the end of our precious liberties, even though 
with Gordon Brown in office, one might not easily see the difference today. <laughs> Sharia. Sharia means the end of our hard-won freedom. For Sharia law denies the equality of men and women, of Muslims and non-Muslims. It does not allow Muslims to leave Islam. Renegades, apostates must be killed according to Islam, as you know. Sharia advocates slavery and does not recognize democracy. As a matter of fact, Sharia is exactly the opposite of democracy. And unfortunately, among European Muslims, the support for this creeping Sharia law is substantial. Last year, the British Centre for Social Cohesion released a survey held under British Muslim students. And some of the outcomes were horrifying. 32% of the British Muslim students said that killing in the name of Islam is justified. And 40% of them said that they supported the introduction of Sharia law in Britain. But be aware, also in the United States of America, also in your country, there is a process of Islamization. There are numerous examples. For instance, Muslim cab drivers who refuse to transport passengers possessing alcohol or guide dogs. Muslim students demanding separate housing on campus, separate hours for Muslim women in gyms and swimming pools, and many U.S. journalists that I've met myself who told me that they self-censor themselves, being afraid of being sued and taken to court. Fortunately, some politicians are not giving in. Your former Republican U.S. Congressman Tom Tancredo is one of those heroes. Last year, he introduced his counter-Sharia Jihad Prevention Act, and that bill would bar the entry of people in the United States who advocate Sharia law. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is what we need. This is exactly what the West needs. Brave leaders who have the courage to do something against the growing Islamization. Ladies and gentlemen, we really do have to stop the Islamization of the West. Because if we don't, we will roll back centuries. It will mean the end of our civilization. If we don't act now, we betray our Western values. We will lose our culture. We will lose our democracy. And we will lose the dearest of our many liberties, which is the right to speak our mind. And the biggest disease in political Europe today is the disease that is called cultural relativism. The misconception that cultures are equal. Well, let me tell you, they are not. Our culture, our Western culture, based on Judaism, on Christianity, and on humanism, is far better than the Islamic culture. And that's why we should support, all of us, the only democracy in the Middle East, which is called the State of Israel. The State of Israel Israel is one of us. As a matter of fact, the fight, the jihad against Israel is not a fight against Israel. It's a fight against us all. It's not, ladies and gentlemen, it's not a territorial conflict. It's jihad. It's jihad against the West. Territorial concessions will have no effect. The jihad will not stop. It will only begin. As I stated in the beginning of my lecture, free speech already is no longer a given in Europe. Last February, I tried to visit Britain, a fellow European country. I was invited to give a speech in the House of Lords by my colleague, Lord Malcolm Pearson. However, upon arrival at Heathrow Airport, I was refused entry in the United Kingdom. They took me for a couple of hours to a detention center and then sent me back on a plane to the Netherlands. And I would have loved, I would have loved so much to be able to remind the audience in the United Kingdom of a great man who once spoke in the House of Commons. 
And in 1982, President Ronald Reagan, the former government of this great state, California, gave a speech in the House of Commons that very few Europeans appreciated. President Reagan called upon the West to reject communism and to defend freedom. And he introduced a new phrase, evil empire. And Reagan's speech at that time stands out as a clarion call to preserve our liberties. And let me quote what President Reagan said. He said that if history, if history teaches anything, it teaches self-delusion in the face of unpleasant facts is folly. And what President Reagan, of course, meant is that you cannot run away from history. You cannot escape the dangers of an ideology that is out to destroy you. Denial is no option. And communism of the 80s is Islam of today. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, just like the British ban, the decision of the Amsterdam Court of Appeal to prosecute me for fitna and my views on Islam is a major blow dealt to freedom of speech in Europe. There are full-fledged attacks on the freedom of speech in order to appease Muslims. And whether or not I will end up in jail is not the most important issue. I gave up my freedom more than four years ago. Indeed, I am under full-time police protection because of those death threats and fatwas from Muslims and terroristic groups like Al-Qaeda. I lived in many safe houses, in army barracks, even in prison cells, but it's not about me. It's not about Geert Wilders. The real question is, will free speech be put behind bars? And we have, we have to defend the freedom of speech. And that's why I propose the withdrawal of all hate speech legislation in Europe. I propose a European First Amendment. In Europe, in Europe, we should defend freedom of speech like you Americans do. Recently, I showed Fitna in the heart of your great democracy, in the US Senate at the invitation of Senator Kyle. Well, at the same time, the European Parliament banned my film twice, both in Strasbourg and in Brussels. Europe should take America as a model. In Europe, freedom of speech should be extended, not restricted. And besides, besides a, first, a European First Amendment, I propose a boycott of the UN Human Rights Council. And I propose the boycott of this terrible council, not just because the worst violators of human rights are members of this council, like Saudi Arabia and Pakistan, but recently this terrifying council adopted a resolution that attempts to kill free speech and the concept of human rights. The resolution on combating defamation of religions does not protect individuals, but shields Islam for criticism. The approved UN resolution calls upon member states to provide legal protection against defamation of religions and incitement to religious hatred. What you should read is no more criticism on Islam. It was supported by the OIC, by the Organization of the Islamic Conference, and it's a next step to the limit of free speech and the appeasement of Muslims. The United Nations that world organization should be ashamed of itself. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, unfortunately, it's a few minutes to 12. In 2009 Europe, Islam is calling for our destruction and free speech is already on trial. If we go on like this, we are heading for the end of our European civilization. But fortunately, many people think like you and me about freedom and liberty. Millions know that liberty is the most precious of gifts. Freedom-loving people have not yet forgotten to whom we owe our liberties. Those were not offered to us on a silver plate, but were bitterly fought for. 
American soldiers fought, bled and died for the freedom of Europe. We owe something to these men and women. Their legacy cannot be squandered and given away. American soldiers did not die for an Islamized Europe. They